Good morning, good people. It's another day in beautiful Livermore. Even with the rain, it's another beautiful day. And let's see, uh, there's a lot going on today. There's uh, a potluck after the service. And uh, by the way, some help could be had um, from you uh, to set up tables and um, take them down after. Please join us, whether you brought food or not, join us for that. And I'm offering a 90 minute of the essentials on UU history and theology. Be there or be square. <laughs> I'm going to be talking really, really fast to get it all in, so you'll have to <laughs> listen carefully. And let's see. I, uh, I ran water from the faucet in my kitchen this morning. Lots going on. <laughs> so um, how many of you were fans of the TV show Futurama? Yeah. Come on, raise your paw. It's OK to admit it. Come on. Okay. It was a Matt Groening series, the same cartoonist, writer, and animator, and producer responsible for The Simpsons and other shows. The quote noted as uh, centering words in your order of service come from that show and are um, the words of uh, um, the character Professor Farnsworth. Now, now, there will be plenty of time to discuss your objections when and if you return. <laughs> I don't know if I just did his voice, but you know, you get the idea. Do you like that? Will there be plenty of time? I wondered as I saw that quote, sort of out of context as it was. And what, what kind of return anyway? It just struck me, while it was indeed out of context, uh, it struck me while I was thinking about this matter of welcoming the future. In a time when more and more people communicate through social media and other means and are wondering about the future, the possibilities and the probabilities, often with out-of-context facts about the present, the past, and the future, In context, the, press, uh, the uh, professor was uh, probably just telling characters that they could argue or debate the finer points of some issue or another when or if they returned from some activity. Granted, that was in the storyline. But out of context, of course, and invoking Loose Association Sunday on you, if they return from some activity, what are the various possibilities one could make of that statement? And one might wonder if thinking about a, an existential or even a transcendent plane, one might wonder, is there such a thing as an afterlife or reincarnation? Will I return after death? Well, that's a profound matter, more so than most. Or, or maybe from a social science perspective, will we or our children get home alive today, given the level of violence in the world, in our country, in our schools, on our streets? One might take that out of context few words and imagine what is possible, if not, of course, desirable. Or could it be taken to mean something about some fantastic notion like, well, cryogenics? Can I trust that I'll be thawed out in time <laughs> and healed just at the right time? Could it be? It's a funny thing to ask, in a way, will there be a future to welcome? Because, of course, there will be. I know that sometimes we're all in doubt about this world and its tomorrow. Me, I'm, I'm banking on at least the next moment. 
Yep, there it went. <laughs> and I'm willing to bank on the next. <laughs> Through time and space. Yep, there it went. And I know that this could change in a split second. I could be wrong in my trust or my prediction. But most often, we proceed taking for granted and expecting the next moment, and for most of us, the rest of the day, and perhaps tomorrow. And of course, we know we can't rely on prediction. And anyway, prediction, if it's just a matter of hours or days that we have left, why in the world would I waste time trying to predict anything? Well, there's stuff to do, for heaven's sake, to enjoy to welcome into our lives right in the very moment that we have. The joy of community, of filial love as shared with a sibling. For we are, as a community, metaphorically speaking, brothers and sisters. Will there be a future to welcome? Well, yes. Now, perhaps without humankind, we just can't predict with any accuracy. As long as we have the ability, however, to remember the past and anticipate the future, as long as we believe in time, in past, future, and present, the future will continue to come. The future will come, so why not welcome it? It's inevitable with or without us. Now, Mr. Prenner, my seventh grade social studies teacher, told us the only things that were inevitable, well, that nothing is certain except death and taxes. You had Mr. Prenner, too? <laughs> wow. But as I read futurist notions of what may be coming ahead, perhaps not even in the distant future, it could very well change up Mr. Prenner's axiom so that the only inevitable of the two, at any rate, death and taxes, could actually be taxes. <laughs> but will we be? Is the continuation of the human species, or any for that matter, but focusing specifically on the human species, is that inevitable? Will we be necessary? Bill Joy, how many people know Bill Joy's name? Yes? Co-founder and former chief scientist at Sun Microsystems, has written, and I quote, our most powerful 21st century technologies, robotics, genetic engineering, and nanotech, are threatening to make humans an endangered species. Joy argues that developing technologies provide a much greater danger to humanity than any technology before. 20th century technologies of destruction, he's quoted as having asserted, such as the nuclear bomb, were limited <coughs> to large governments due to the complexity and cost of such devices, as well as the difficulty in acquiring the required materials. Do you see this falling apart now? He also voiced concern about increasing computer power. His worry was that computers will eventually become more intelligent than people, leading to the possibility, if not the probability, that one day there'll be a robot rebellion. He suggested that it was necessary to assess technologies, to gauge their implicit dangers, as well as having scientists refuse to work on technologies that have the potential to cause harm. Scientists supported by big business, and certainly to some extent, government has become big business too. Well, the ethical challenges certainly are enormous. 
And me, I ran water from a faucet this morning in my kitchen. And most of my life, I've been able to get good potable water that way. Here, to your good health. Those engaged in predicting the future, experts in the realm of hard and social sciences, have their ways, their methodologies, that is. They gather different kinds of information in different ways to help them predict the future in their areas of expertise. What will be the economic system favored? What kinds of government will we have? Where will technological advances have taken us? if not you and me, literally the larger us, humanity. We often think of looking at history as at least part of, of the information that's needed to predict possibilities and probabilities for the future. Scientists, of course, do it. So do you and I, whether or not we map them out, as researchers do. But history isn't all. And the methodologies of the past, in some instances, even the not so distant past, have failed to take into account dimensions other than those for which they, as specialists, as oracles, have considered. Now, I read about Joy's ideas secondhand, really, in a book of essays, What the Future Holds. What I love most about this book in this moment, and my finding it, is that it was written 15 years ago. I could look for what these intelligent people were saying about the future and could look and see if, if some of what they maybe imagined actually had come into being. Now, one of the easy things to do is, uh, in this sleuthing I was about was to look for the ideas about technology and technological advances generally. It, it seemed to me that some of the things that have come into being those experts either had thought of or hadn't thought of, maybe, or hadn't articulated in any case, or that perhaps they might not have imagined would have come into being. They wouldn't have predicted that, that they would have come into being so quickly, that they would have become ubiquitous so quickly. Everything seems to be changing so very quickly, at least in that dimension of technology. Just look at some of the technological advances. Only in the past 10 years, we have computer tablets and e-readers. Only 10, within the past 10 years. The Mars rover Curiosity, assessing Mars as a possible second home. Augmented reality devices, rockets that don't just travel into space, but come back and can be used again. Solar roof shingles, robots that can hop and even run, and power walls. There's genetic editing. There are K-cups to make coffee in a matter of seconds, one at a time. And there's a blood test that takes the place of amniocentesis to detect abnormalities in fetuses. Why, in a lab, just a couple of years ago, an entire species of malaria-carrying mosquitoes may have been heading toward extinction because of gene editing. Your credit card needn't be swiped anymore because we have chip cards for a kind of so-called better protection. And there's been a social media explosion that has made the world much smaller. Now, have you welcomed any or all of these into your world? And are you open to what's next, even when we don't know what that will be? We not only have smartphones beyond the iPhone that came into being just 12 years ago, but we have smart watches, hello. <laughs> we have 3D printing. We have drones for play and for war, for surveillance and deliveries of many kinds. 
There now exist, my friends, bionic eyes. Clearly, some of these creations have potential for good and evil. We know that. We've seen that with drones, for example. And we've seen that with genetic testing. I'm amazed by some of these things, some of which hold so much potential for good in the hands of people with a working moral compass, that is. And I wonder, too, are we asking the best questions in science, technology, the movie industry, all manner of corporations and organizations, education and legal systems, in governments, and in ourselves? Are we asking the right questions of all of these? Are we headed into a world where supranational governance, as with the European Union, becomes the dominant mode of governance? I wonder what Tim Bessley, a professor at the London School of Economics, is saying today about that matter, as he proclaimed that the EU was a model, the leading edge in governance. I wonder what he would say today in the age of Brexit. He asserted that a kind of global governance was going to come, given the nature and a better understanding of global issues, noting that climate change was one major impetus, or should be, to take our governance in this direction. He was saying this 15 years ago, as our current government leadership pulls us out of international coalitions and agreements, I wonder if a better understanding of problems like global climate change is to be assumed that, that our leaders understand it, that they will understand what comes, and as a result, will act responsibly responsibly to the human community, to all of life, to all of existence. Shall we welcome the future? And I wonder about Martin Luther King. You know, we all wondered, I think, when President Obama ran and won the presidency, what would Dr. King say? Could he have imagined this, predicted this, or imagined it in what amounts to the, really, the near future of his lifetime. Could he have? I wonder if Dr. King would look at the coalition building, the coalition building Reverend William Barber is doing with the renewed Poor People's Campaign. I wonder how he would look at that. Because Dr. King was very strategic, understandably. Bayard Reston was one of his lieutenants. He was slated to become the head of the Southern Christian Leadership Conference until people objected because he's a gay man. And so King said to him, not going to work. It's going to be too divisive. I'm sorry. Where today, it's a different time and place and culture to some extent. And Reverend Barber is building coalitions across many lines Dr. King feared to cross. So many ideas about the future that evoke wonder, even amazement, yet how many at the forefront are asking the right questions Questions that go beyond the economic bottom line. Environmental advocate Van Jones asks, he implores us to ask how we can be innovative in sustainable ways. Jones says, we need a much deeper understanding of exactly what it is our industrial society, our industrialized parts of the world. We need to look deeply and understand exactly in its present creation, what are these things jeopardizing in our world? We need a more profound perception of what is at stake, not in one direction, economics, governance. 
but looking at the totality and the diversity of needs in different communities. What that means to me in part is that the meaning of the bottom line, the meaning of the bottom line itself needs to change across all disciplines and all of our consciousness. While historically that phrase that comes from profit and loss accounting has been used for over 50 years, metaphorically speaking, figuratively speaking, the new bottom line needs to look at the complexity of life and include not just financial pluses and minuses, but impact on communities that are different in shape, size, location, resources, and values too. We are faced now with more speculation, perhaps, not necessarily knowledge, of what the future might hold on this macro level. Because of living in an age of rapid fire communication, the blessing and curse of the internet and social media, time is compressed. And what is new isn't new for very long. And new comes at us very quickly and disappears when something else takes its place. So what is this business of welcoming the future? Well, I ran water this morning from my tap. Almost all of my life, I have been able to do so. It is a privilege. It really is. I do not live in the outskirts of Managua, Nicaragua, nor in an isolated village in rural Congo, nor along the Ganges, nor in Flint, Michigan. I ran the water and filled a glass, and it was good. What about your grandmother or great-grandmother? Did they have water in the house from a tap? It was something in someone's imagination and, and, and in their know-how that brought that ability. Not just one someone, but probably groups of someone. Their ability to create this, something that we now take for granted, this privilege we enjoy, simply having a drink of potable water right at hand. What would the bottom line look like, the new bottom line, that would make it so the best minds and resources would be brought to bear on bringing potable water into every home, everywhere. I don't need a new one of these, by the way. My smart watch. I welcome the future and invite you to do this as well, without knowing the particulars because in so much of it, we, we just cannot accurately predict. We can aim for the good and welcome the possibility of realizing it. The future that I welcome is the future of the opportunity to live one day at a time and to do the good together that we dream of. I know that we move forward that is inevitable, in the sense that time neither stands still nor goes in reverse. But I'm waiting for that one. I, wanna, I want a little time machine to check out some old stuff. You can welcome the future in the life of this congregation and aim high with hope and intention, commitment of your many different kinds of resources, and right action as best as you are able you can continue the human project of building this institution, this community, not just in service to yourselves, but in service to the greater good. That we probably, all of us in this room, probably all have running potable, life-sustaining water, we can consider, even so, as we drink. What are the questions we need to ask today? How shall we insist that our experts and authorities
create the building blocks of our collective future, even if some of us or even many of us aren't around to see that good realized fully. We can consider what we must ask of ourselves and how we shall act day by day, by day, and act as best we can accordingly. So may it be. And all my